and Stephanie Burke, and I'm trying to press all the right buttons here to make sure that I don't screw up what's going on on the radio, because we are streaming live on YouTube and via the Spooky South Coast app and SpookySouthCoast.com. If you haven't downloaded the free Android app yet, then go right ahead and do so. We can wait. <laughs> and uh, and it shouldn't take that long because it's not a huge huge app. You know, it's a very very small. It won't take up a lot of space on your device. And you can get to the show. You can get to the archives of the show. You can get to the live video stream, the live audio stream. However, you need Spooky South Coast. You can get it all right there on that free Android app. And of course, we're always on SpookySouthCoast.com as well. You can see the chat room. You can see the 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 audio is weak. Is that something I can fix over here? I just uh, okay. You get it? You good? We we need to uh, work on the mental telepathy so I don't have to ask these questions out loud. But we're we're YouTube streaming only right now, so we don't have to be professional. We can be like every other show that's on YouTube. <laughs> S- so that means we need to do the the mannequin challenge. Uh, the water bottle flipping. What else? What else do people do now? I'm not hip to uh, the new track. Oh, you, don't even, you don't even have a microphone. What, what happened? Right. Oh, it's over there. Way over there. Okay. <laughs> you are the silent assassin. So I guess I won't ask you about last night at uh, House of Bricks Wrestling then. I wasn't going to anyway, but I'm just, just trying to throw you off because you don't have a microphone. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I do want to talk about before we get into the discussion with our guest, Jim Harold. He'll be joining us in just a bit. Uh, The story has come out over the past couple of days that the Amityville house has been sold once again. It went on the market this past summer uh, after the previous owners purchased it. I think it was originally $1.2 million was the original asking price. They paid $950,000. I had called them numerous times. (laughs) Well, I say numerous. four, Four or five times. I left messages on their voicemail, and they never returned my calls. And uh, But now the house has been sold again for $850,000. So they took a $100,000 loss wow. after a couple of years, which you know you think is... And add into it the fact that it's $22,000 a year in property taxes. So what have they had it for? I think three, three years they've owned it? Three or four. So you know, you're looking at almost $200,000 lost on the sale of this house. How does that happen? But anyway, the house has supposedly been purchased this week. I haven't seen it in any of the actual news stories that I've seen coming from the area. I've seen it from from some other like weird news sites and things like that where they've mentioned that a famous paranormal celebrity purchased the house, but I haven't seen it mentioned in like the New York Daily News, which is the paper record for the Amityville area. But everybody's speculating as to who the... (laughs) paranormal personality is that purchased this house i think we can just go around the table right now and say it wasn't any of us right no because i i can't even no. buy a pizza at 7-eleven right now but i won't start a can of worms on that conversation why 7-eleven pizza yeah why you had a huge controversy on your page the other day over it. oh i know and i talked about it this morning on the radio as well oh yeah i was gonna say well i didn't say i didn't I have, have one an EB, way i didn't have it. an ebt card but right uh so the you know, the process of elimination. There's not a lot of paranormal celebrities that can afford to buy a $950,000 house, at least that I'm aware of. You know, at least in t- maybe somebody's independently wealthy. You know, maybe maybe somebody that's been, uh, you know, um, a, a third tier paranormal TV show cast member that I'm not even aware of. Uh, their family. Actually, I just. There was a guy that won the lottery, but I don't think he won that much. But anyway, going back. The guy from Connecticut? Uh, I think he was from North Northern Mass. But I'm not sure. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because I don't think it was him. But by process of, elim- process of elimination, if I had to guess two people, my guess would be Zach Bagans and Jason Hawes. Just because they're the it's ones. Jason. And Jason already came out and said that it wasn't him. So that would be the only two people that I would put high enough in the earnings ranks because of their producer credits and because right. of the, the, the roles that they have on the shows that they were part of. That's that I would put them out that, that high. So that leaves Zach. Now we know that Zach has spent money in the past on different things that he thinks. I don't know if it's that he looks at his potential projects, 
or if he looks at it as being like, I should be the guy to own this. But, you know, he purchased that demon house in Indiana. That ended up falling apart, the documentary he was going to put together on that. And uh, that ended up falling apart. And I think he sold the house and it's been destroyed at this point. Yes. I heard that. But so he's the only other person that I think would have the coin to be able to purchase this house. Nothing's been said yet. It's still in negotiations. Once it does go through, there'll be a property transfer. And then it will be a matter of public, public record. record yeah. But it doesn't mean that we're going to see, you know, 108 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, New York, transferred to Zach Bagans. We're going to see it's probably some sort of company. Right. Some LLC. It can be that. Or it can be a trust. It can be any kind of thing right. to, because, you know, you're also going to want to protect the investment if that's the idea behind it. If it's, if it's not your primary home, then protect it. But, you know, knowing him, he probably will, will move in. And, but anyway, here's, here's the, the situation. Well, I thought he hates the East Coast. I, I think you make an exception to live in the Amityville house. So, really? Yeah. If if you're him and, and you're, you know, suppose... There's just not much anybody can do with it because it has to stay residen- residential. And so. that's, the, that's the problem that everybody is, uh, you know, complaining about is like, well, I would buy it and I'd turn it into a bed and breakfast. I would buy it and I would turn it into a paranormal yeah. museum. You have to understand. It doesn't work like that. It's zoned residential. Right. Because we already had this conversation three years ago. Mm-hmm. I had a money guy... That was willing to buy it mm-hmm. and do that. And he said, there's no point in even trying right. because the zoning is for residential and they're not going to change it. You can get exceptions to residential zoning for certain things. And usually a bed and breakfast can fall under those guidelines. Right. But the problem is the neighbors have to sign off on it. The neighbors are not going to sign off on it there. No, because they're already living in a, a space where... Their privacy is basically being interrupted probably on a daily basis with tourists. They don't like the fact that people come and park outside the house and run up to the house and take photos. They don't like the fact that every time a new movie comes out, there's more attention being paid to their neighborhood. Right. So. And there is a new movie coming out in January. So, yeah, which is a, a whole different story that I don't know. I've been told some stuff behind the scenes. I don't know how much I can reveal now, but there'll yep. be, we'll definitely be having some kind of a, a discussion and an announcement about this coming up very soon. Good to know. But, uh, but yeah, so there, I don't think there's a real, you know, need to buy it unless you just want to live in it. I mean, it's a nice house. It looks like it. And if I, listen, if I was in the market for an $850,000 house right. in Amityville, New York, and I didn't mind paying $22,000 a year in property taxes, I would probably consider buying it. Right. Because of just my connection to the story and my interest in the story. But I don't think that the average person is, you know, I, I think a lot of people would be deterred by what's been going on with that house over the last, you know, 40 years. And also, I think a person would be deterred from the forthcoming attention the fact that there's another movie coming out and you know chris quarantino is going to be coming out with his side of the story there's going to be all different kinds of things that will be putting more attention on it so if you're looking for a nice relaxing eight hundred fifty thousand dollar house that's probably not the one to buy right so but what do you do if you're in the position of say a zach and you want to buy it and you can't do anything commercial with it you're buying it just for the status of having it yeah pretty much and i guess we really can't say anything about that except well good for him that yeah you know he's earned that money and can spend it however he sees fit so a lot of money uh, you know all these people who are uh getting on here and uh complaining uh, you know i put it up on facebook chris lutz put it up on facebook yep. anybody who's Getting on there and being like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Well, well, how are we going to stop this? You can't stop it. Right. You know, unless what does we, that matter? Unless we want to start a GoFundMe to all collectively buy the house and then have nobody live in it and nobody go into it. But what's the point of stopping it? I, I, I don't understand why people feel like there's a need to, but they do. But it's bizarre. It's a house. That's it. And depending on, you know... Who you want to believe. It's a house where nothing's gone on in a very long time. We could get into that too. I mean, if you want to listen to the people who have lived there since. Right. Since the Lutzes have moved out, really. Mm-hmm. Nobody else has reported anything going on. So if that's the case, then we're trying to protect something that doesn't need protecting. Of course. But. And I say we, I'm talking about paranormal people. Right. I mean, but if you look at it from a different point of view, people can argue um, like what had happened on your Facebook post today, that everything was faked and it's, you know, nothing happened, but 
if you know anything about how, you know, anything in the paranormal works, certain people's psychic energy can awaken certain things to happen in houses. Or you can have spirits that follow you from place to place. So it might not necessarily be the house or it could just be the people that were living in the house had didn't I mean, have the right chemistry. And Chris told us when he was on with us that whatever was there has followed him. Right. So it has, you know, maybe it has departed that house and followed them around. And, right. You know, you're buying. I mean, I, there's also the aspect of you're owning a piece of history. Right. To some degree, infamous history, but you're still owning something that has a pop culture value to it. And perhaps, you know, buying the Amityville house is no different than buying the A-Team van. Or going to an auction and buying like a prop from a movie, you know, it's, it's you want to have that piece of of history for yourself, and that's it. Listen, as long as you're gonna buy the house and and pay the taxes and everything, nobody can really say anything, right? We can't we can't pick who can buy a house as long as they have the means. Uh, now that's up to the neighborhood though as well, because you know the, the neighborhood can make it hard for them to live there if that's what they choose to do. Yeah, but they can't stop the person from buying it. No, but they can make it so that once he gets there, he can be like, why am I staying here? I don't want to stay here. You know, if you buy a house and then all of a sudden, every single time you have friends over, they call the police and, you know, all these different things that can go, you know, you know how it works, Moniz. You've been kicked out of many neighborhoods, I'm sure. <laughs> I have, true. <laughs> so yeah, That's why he lives where he does now because nobody right. else wants him. That's, uh, people ask, where do you live now? He's like, it doesn't matter. Nobody else is around except uh, the guy to your... Yeah, except Left the there. silent assassin. And he's he's already I mean, that's, that's arguable too. He's over there formulating a plan. He's like, So you call the cops and complain? <laughs> that's how it starts. That's how I don't have to move. So uh, and that's a great point brought up in the chat room by a pseudo name is a pop culture value sold at a loss of two hundred thousand dollars. That's what I think is the the most telling sign. It's almost like if if you're going to buy this, and let's just say you're the biggest paranormal star in the world, okay? And you have all the money in the world to spend on frivolous purchases, if that's what you want to do. And you're like, I'm going to buy the Amityville house because I can. Anybody, if you have any kind of financial advisor behind you, they're going to look at you and say, you idiot, don't buy that house. It just devalued $200,000 in three years. Mm -hmm. It's a bad investment. Yeah, unless it's your forever home. Yeah, unless you want to live in it. Right. Yeah, but I mean, but if you're if you're buying this house just because you want to buy it to own it, you're going to lose money on the deal. Of course. And, and maybe, you know, you just say, well, hey, whatever. It's worth that to me. You know, if somebody told me right now that I could buy it and, you know, still had the, the means to live elsewhere and still had the means to, to live comfortably, it's not going to kill me to buy this house. I would I would consider it. I would because of the interest that I've always had in it. And maybe you can buy it for yourself and go stay there and research it on your own and investigate it on your own and be happy with that. Maybe you never have to do anything more than maybe write a book or, you know, make a vlog on YouTube or something. Do they still do vlogs? That's the whole thing. And so maybe, am I, am I dating myself with my terminology? You can no. just take out your gigapet and no, I'm just, so, but, <laughs> but I'm just saying like, that's, it's something that you can do. It's entirely also possible that there's no reason why if it was Zach who purchased the house that he couldn't go in there and make his own film. They right. can't stop you from making a documentary in your own house. Right. If it's just you. I mean, he's a cameraman. He's an editor. He can do all of the stuff involved in making a documentary without having to bring any kind of production crews down there to do it. So it's entirely possible that that could be what's going on. He definitely has the resources. So if that's the case, then, you know, all I say is... Good luck. Good luck with whatever comes out. Good luck with whatever project you try to put together. Good luck with getting along with the neighbors. Uh, and, you know, just good luck in living there in general. Hopefully nothing bad happens, but <laughs> uh, I'll leave it at that. Well, as Stephanie pointed out, sometimes it takes the right type of personality to bring things out in a haunting. And we know from him being in other places that we personally witness, sometimes Zach can make that happen because of his personality. Would you not agree? Yeah, I mean, it's po it's possible that him being there could draw things out. It's possible that him being there could influence whatever's going on there. Maybe something's followed him from some of the places that he's put him in. You know, maybe it's 
it could be a variety of these factors that play into it. I don't know. I'm I'm behaving myself, and I'm not getting uh, I'm not getting I'm not going down the path that I think people are expecting me to go down with. What I think would happen. I don't think it's worth it. You know, but I think everybody kind of gets what I'm saying. Right. So that uh, that will be something that we will certainly keep an eye on uh, because you know that we never stop talking about that house in that case. And uh, and I was talking with Chris earlier today, and I think uh, we'll probably have him on sometime soon to talk about the forthcoming movie that's coming out and mm-hmm. some things that are going on around that. So uh, stay tuned for that and be prepared that that will be the night that the app crashes and the website stream goes down. It's, it's funny because... Uh, just a little bit of a side note. The, the person that we have both been talking to, you and I, yes. when I was uh, having a Skype conversation with her the other day, mm-hmm. no lie, I, I mentioned what happens when we talk about that. Yep. And the entire uh, thing the, shut the, down. The, the whole Skype conversation just crapped out I, um, and hung up. I had a Skype conversation with um, the other person that we talked about. We're so cryptic. We are really cryptic. We're so cryptic. Lauren Coleman's outside wanting to investigate us. <laughs> and um, I mentioned the word puck wedgies and started to tell a story and my entire Skype wiped out. I was like, well, that's not weird. I'm telling you, man. Can't blame that on Mercury Retrograde this time either. No. And I was so shocked that I couldn't believe what had happened. So um, maybe we'll blame it on Skype. Maybe. And, uh, and speaking of Skype, Chris is uh, actually messaging me about that matt do you want to um do you want to see if we can are you going to be able to bring up that music to give us a little bit of a, a i don't even know how to like turn this down to be able to test it i'm just going to respond to him talk amongst yourselves so what are you going to do if it actually is zach let's put it that way um buddy up to him and ask him if I can come over <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> Be like, Zach, remember me? Yeah. <laughs> remember remember when we hung out in the basement of the Lizzie Borden house before you like mocked me on Twitter and stuff? But uh, oh I God. think you should have me come over for dinner. I'll cook and you know we'll, you we'll just see what happens. I'll, uh, I'll make one of those sandwiches I put up on Instagram all the time. I have to admit to being completely ignorant to anything to do with the Amnivale horror. Well, that's because you don't, uh, you don't actually I know, watch. I know, but I mean, obviously, I know where it is, like it exists, everything else. But um, no, I'm, I'm not into horror movies, so. Which is a shame because I've been telling you about some really good stuff, Matt. You had you mentioned have. to me Black Mirror. I started watching that today. Yeah, I don't know if that would. Uh, that's it's, it's not exactly qualified as horror. No, she could watch it. She could totally watch yeah, it. Yeah, really. It's really. It's 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 interesting. I like it. What's it about? It's um. It's like a, I don't. What do you call it? Anthology series. I yes, guess? I would actually. If I had to refer to it as something, I would call it as the Twilight Zone. If the Twilight Zone was. It's like with Mr. Robot. Technology based. Interesting. Right. Yeah. It's looking at technology and how it can impact people, and uh, how. Technology, how it can impact people, and kind of the cautionary tale of what can happen as a result of it. I I might look it up. Are you talking kind of like Sliver? No, I've never seen that. Sliver is that the one with the the like, leechy things? Well, that you, just sounds. No, creepy. you're talking about the, the that's, a, that's a. Are you talking about the movie with uh, Sharon Stone and Michael I, Douglas? I believe so. Yeah. Oh. No, I never watched that. No. I've never, ever watched a movie like that at 9.30 at night on Cinemax when my parents didn't know that I was watching TV in my room. Oh, my God. No, never happened. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a Sharon Stone movie. No, I don't think I've seen that one. But that's the one that's, with all the security cameras. Wait, this, this, all is all, this is, is, yeah, is, is podcast podcast only, right? Yes. Which is Sharon Stone the one that... Um, Basic that, Instinct. Yeah, that sh- yeah. showed her uh, yeah. for JJ? Yes, yes. Oh okay. God. The same one. <laughs> Great. So the, uh, yeah, it, it's just some different technological ideas and, and, and what can happen if people become too, like the one that I just watched before I left, uh, was about being able to 
speak to the dead after they've died. Okay. Oh, that's the next one I'm watching. Season two? Yeah. You only watched season one? I've, uh, well, I've, I'm jumping around. Oh, you're jumping around. You can do that. You it is an anthology. Jump well, it's an anthology well, series. Netflix, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, it's weird. It is weird how they've like positioned all the episodes. Yeah, like, they were like out of order. S- season one is only three episodes. Yeah, it's it's it's, hmm. it's it's an anthology series, so none of the stories are connected. Okay. So you can kind of just watch them, but this one was you know being able to talk to the dead, and but what it is is it's it's not spiritual. It's not what you do. It's not what we try to do when we investigate. It's a software program where it takes it scans everything the person ever put out online. Okay. And tries to have a conversation with you through like a messenger. That's weird. Oh, wait, the I, way that they I would did, speak. I did watch one, that one. That's the one with uh, the guy who died in the car crash. Yes. Which I, I think I just ruined it. Whoever did. No, no, you didn't. I mean, if you read the episode info, you know somebody has right. to die. So, and then what happens is they go, you know, they, they, this, this program will go through all the stuff you've ever put online and figure out the kind of things that you would say mm-hmm. and allow you to carry on a conversation with your loved one who is still alive and you can kind of go back and forth, but then it keeps taking it up another notch. That's so it weird. goes from being able to talk on the phone, uh, from talking on the computer to talking on the phone and hearing their voice. And I won't even, I don't want to ruin it by saying where else it goes. That's bizarre. But it's, uh, it was certainly, certainly very interesting and certainly very, um, it, you know, I I was watching it saying, you know, this, this, they shouldn't be doing this. This is not natural. This mm-hmm. is not something that should be going on. And it, it makes you stop and think that maybe, there isn't. The weird part about it is it's not out of the realm of possibility. It seems like the direction that we're going, you know, we're only a couple steps away from. Right. Did you see the one? Uh, it was the second episode ever, but it was the one where. Uh, was it the, the um, kind of. They have that American Idol type right, show. Yeah. I mean, that does that not seem entirely plausible that at some point we'll all just have these avatars of ourselves? Oh, yeah. I watched that episode and I was like, I'm going outside. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. I don't want to live in this cell. And although it would be pretty awesome to be in a room that's one big monitor. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and, and like we, we think all the time, like, wouldn't it be great to just have free porn whenever you want? <laughs> but it was actually a, a nuisance and a problem in that episode. That, that's and what it was. charged. Uh, right? and it, that's what it was. It was pop up ads within your life. And I was like, just that alone, like that little piece is a commentary on pop up ads. Mm hmm. You know, so eh, anyway, I think we're kind of getting off topic a little bit uh, here. Just a little. But that's, that's all right, because okay. we're actually going to be uh, joined by our guest, Jim Harold in just a couple seconds. So I'm going to try and bring him up here now. And again, we are this is going to be an adventure because normally when we try to bring people up on Skype or on the radio and we can take a break and we can make sure all the connections are working. Uh, and also, we usually have the Skype program downloaded on the station computer, but they've they've decided to get fancy mm. and, and redo the computer and didn't reinstall Skype. Right. Of course I'm, not. I'm just hoping there's not going to be an audio loop with things being both everything in audio. Oh my god, it's web based. But that's fine. You you, you you're sure that it's not going to I think it will be all right. Let's try it. If not, What's Chris <laughs> Chris is around. Chris can always try and uh get the information another way. So let's see what I love web here. only shows. Everything just goes to <sighs> crapola. I'm trying to make the call. Now I have to install the plugin, add the extension. Naturally. Oh, boy. Dun, 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 See, dun, this, dun. Is, this is how uh, this is how it starts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this, th- there's actually going to be an episode of Black Mirror about what we are doing right now. Can you imagine? Like warning us exactly how bad of an idea this is. <laughs> you know what's going to happen? Uh, you know what? I'm just going to I'm going to cancel this right now. Because it's going to ask us for admin permission to install the plugin. Uh, uh, uh. So I'm just closing right out of that web based Skype and saying forget it. Keep in mind that this is a guest that we've been trying to get on the show for three months now, and we're figuring this out as we go on the air. So that's how we roll. Yeah, just putting that out there. I'll stay quiet in my corner. All right. So anyway, oh the if you haven't seen the show, I recommend it. Uh, Moniz, you have Netflix, right? No. All right. You, you have somebody's Netflix password you can steal, right? I Yeah, I could do that. I, so Everybody has Uncle Greg. That they can. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that one family member who only has one device that's Netflix capable. Yep. And so you're like, hey, what's your password? You're not going to put it on anything else. Stephanie, you have Netflix. I do have Netflix. Okay. I actually canceled it, but I have to restart it. Because Gilmore Girls are coming yep, back. I knew you exactly were going to say it. that. I knew that's How exactly you know? where I was going. 
Well, I, I restart. Actually, I joined Such Netflix. A lie. Is that bad or good? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know. How do you? You've never seen Gilmore Girls? Of course, I have. I'm gonna say we're fired. You're fired from this yeah. friendship right now. I um I actually get a Netflix account because of Fuller House, and uh. And then you canceled it because you're like, this is terrible. No, I canceled it, it when on? I was done watching Fuller House. Yeah. yeah, they got renewed. Um, for season two. So, um. But why pay for Netflix if I'm not gonna use it in the months in between? Waiting for Gilmore Girls, so I got to start it back up this week so I can watch it. Because there's so much other stuff you can watch. Yeah, like Adam Sandler movies <laughs> and Kevin Smith movies. Wet Hot American yeah. Summer. I just never. I, I saw that Kevin any. Smith movie come up, and I was like, I'm gonna cancel my Netflix. Which, which which movie was that? It's some like spy movie that he just made. Really? I don't remember which that which one that one is. It just came out. Yeah. They give you like that notification that like they want you to watch it. Not right now. No, no, no. I turned off notifications. Smart man. Yeah, so I, I just use on demand usually, or I don't really watch anything. Or nothing that you guys would be interested I in. Say, I'm just looking at you with this blank look on my face, like, what do you do with your time? It's just Harry Potter movies and. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did watch, and I did watch the second Harry Potter movie today because I had nothing else to do. But. You just, um, <laughs> you just have kindred spirits on every TV in your house. I do. No, I I do have it recorded. I have to catch up on kindred spirits. Um, I don't my, think I've watched an episode since yours just because I haven't had time. So I got a marathon coming my way. I um I had a two episode marathon go on the other day and I got to catch up on, I think, one or two more. Um, but I watched Disney Junior all day. So I don't have time to watch TV for myself. But uh, I did get to watch The Curse of Oak Island today in Hunting Hitler. Speaking of That which, was on Nick Jr.? No, it was oh. not. <laughs> We have to get a... <laughs> could, you ima- could you imagine if there was a Nick Jr. show about looking for Hitler? Mm. Like, just imagine. Like, like ba- baby Hitler? Like, Come baby on, Hitler. guys. We have to go find Hitler. <laughs> oh, my God. Why? What are we going to do when we find him? We're going to hug him. We're going to make him love everybody. <laughs> oh, my God. It was really interesting. You guys should watch it if you haven't seen it. And especially because I talked to the guy that's on it, and he wants to come on the show. So. Well, yeah. Well, not Hitler. No, not Hitler. Okay, because I'm not, I'm not going to book Hitler. No. So uh, it's it's fascinating, um, fascinating. Uh, Matt Casa, uh, Muppet Babies are coming out too, like on, a, on the Disney Channel. The old um, no, they're coming out with a new Muppet Babies. I don't know how I feel about new things. Yeah, none of that has. Did you get my message? I, I heard about, about Fraggle Rock. Chris, Chris messaged us Jim's number. Oh, I was hoping you could maybe get him on the line yeah. in the other room, just because it'll be slightly more professional. <laughs> slightly more. professional. And I say slightly. Uh, but we will see if we can get into the discussion. Uh, in the meantime, you can go to Jim's website, jimherald.com. It's the easiest place to find everything about Jim. You can find out uh, all about his different podcasts that he does. You can also find out about all of his books, which we will talk with him about all of those. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, he's been running the uh, Paranormal Podcast since 2005. So if you, if you go back in time a little bit, you know, we're, we're in our 10th year or our 11th year now, but we, you know, we're going to be celebrating our 11th anniversary coming up in January, but we started putting the show together in, uh, uh, October, September, October, November of 2005. And it took us a little while to practice enough where they felt comfortable letting us come on the air. And even then they were still wrong. And <laughs> which is why, you know, they were on college football tonight. But, uh, so the... But in those early days, there was there was nothing. There were no shows really to be able to listen to online. You would listen to Coast to Coast. Thank you. You would listen to, uh, I think the Ghostly Talk podcast was already around at that point. You know, there were these little couple little shows that like Matt Coss and I would would listen to, and be like, okay, let's kind of get a feel of how other people are exploring this topic. But there wasn't really a lot around. But when you looked and you tried to find paranormal podcasts, what came up all the time? But the paranormal podcast, and it's been the number one paranormal podcast ever since. And uh, and Jim Harold, the host of that, joins us now on the line. Good evening, Jim. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you all doing tonight? We are battling technology because we should have just been smart enough to go <laughs> podcast only from the beginning. I saw, I saw on the live stream, so I was following the Black Mirror discussion, which is a great show, and then your struggles with Skype. But hey, we made it. That's, and the important part is that we can still have a conversation like normal people 
the you know the good old fashioned way through this archaic device known as the telephone. Somehow it always seems to work better than anything else. <laughs> well, and when as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, since two thousand five, you've been doing the paranormal podcast. It's it's not easy. Uh, Ten years ago, you know, eleven years ago now, it's not easy to be able to do a show where you're bringing people into the discussion and where you're having these conversations with people fighting against that technology at the same time. Did it, did it take a while before the technical ability caught up to how you envision wanting to do the show? Well, you know, actually Skype, I think used to be better than it is now, to be honest with you, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, there were a lot of, you know, I started with like a $20 headset and like a kind of crummy computer and I have a, a much better setup now. So, yeah, it's been an evolution and figuring out how to do different things with websites. But it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I don't think I'd have it any other way. It's kind of nice, as, as you guys know, doing your own thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a very cool medium, and I'm very lucky to, to be a part of it. What I've always liked about your show and, and just your approach in general is, you know, everybody has kind of a different, way of doing things and everybody kind of has a different voice i think we've lost a lot of that as now there's 2000 paranormal based podcasts right. all over all over the internet but I, I think everybody kind of had their own personality shine through and 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 your ability as a storyteller and just somebody who you want to hear talk helped bring a lot of people into that show whereas opposed to you know if if you were somebody who was uh just kind of you know, floating your way through it, I think that that would have turned people off to thinking about podcasts as being a viable way of transmitting information about the paranormal. I think your personality is what helped draw people in. Oh, well, thank you. That's really nice of you to say. You know, my thing is, is that, you know, occasionally, and most people are really nice, but I get uh, someone who says, well, you do this wrong, or you do that wrong, or I don't like the way you do this, and the way I don't like the way you do that. And my feeling is, is that with so many shows out there, you know, everybody can gravitate to the person uh, or the people who they like the best in terms of the way they present it. And I present the way that I uh, present it, and I hope that over the last... Uh, well, almost 12 years now, I've gotten better, but I think it's basically I'm the same guy I was when I started in 2005, uh, kind of the same uh, sensibility. Uh, some people like it, some people don't, but luckily I've got a, had a nice following build over the years, and I'm very thankful to those people who enjoy what it is I do, and I'm just trying to do more of it and, and hopefully improve a little bit every year, and we just keep, uh, we keep at it. But thank you for your kind words. Well, and if you go all the way back to, you know, the, the first time that you tried to put together a podcast, the first time that you wanted to, you know, have have this voice and, and talk about the paranormal, uh, you know, it's it's changed so much between then and now, just in terms of not only the technology used to do so, but just the way that the conversation has evolved over the last 10 years, uh, the last 11 years now. Do you feel like it's easier now to talk about this topic and there's less explanation involved there's less you know background required for the listener because you're getting people who are coming in not only because they've been listening to your show all along but also because they're so familiarized with the topic now oh i agree with that that's a that's that's very true i think i mean you know even 11 12 years ago there was a lot less out there about this stuff i mean of course you had some of the, the TV shows that were out, and I, I mean, there were even shows, I mean, when I was a real little kid, like in elementary school, I kind of got started off with In Search Of by Leonard Nimoy, so there's always been some stuff, but it really has exploded, um, and of course, you had Coast to Coast AM with uh, Art Bell and later George Norrie, but now, I mean, it's all over the place, it's almost saturated, and, but I do think that people come in and you know, it used to be, well, what is a shadow person? And now the question will be, well, okay, well, of the various possibilities of a shadow person, is it an interdimensional traveler? Is it a ghost? I mean, people are going, as you said, to like two or three levels down, and it kind of keeps you on your toes because people will send me notes about things that, that I'm not aware of, even having done, you know, well over a thousand shows on these subjects. Um, you know, I'm learning something new all the time, and particularly with the Campfire Show, which is my true, uh, true supernatural story show. You know, uh, occasionally people will come on and, and start talking about something that I'm not familiar with. One of the things that's really hot right now that I'm enjoying hearing 
is people talking about things like the Mandela effect, things like tulpas, and these are things that, you know, we didn't talk about 10, 11, 12 years ago, and just hearing more and more of the black-eyed kids. I mean, there's some newer topics out there that that are pretty fascinating. So, I, uh, you know, as I go along, I hope I'm learning more and more so I can ask those intelligent uh, and deeper questions. And what I find fascinating about it, and, and I think you've gone through the same process that we've gone through in, in our almost 11 years being on the radio, too, of, you know, you start peeling back these layers and you're trying to answer the questions, the bigger questions. And so you're attacking these topics in a way where you can kind of peel back the layers and come to understand them. But when you're peeling them back, what you're finding isn't fact and you're not finding right. answers you're finding more questions, more questions that that lead to better <laughs> that lead to stories and you're bringing it back to the story which is what you've done with campfire stories you know you've been able to bring it back to the fact that sometimes it's just it's fun and interesting to talk about this stuff and not worrying about solving it and figuring it all out right yeah that's the difference you know i have my two main free shows the paranormal podcast which is the first one i started in 05 and then Campfire, which I started in 09, and they're kind of two different approaches, and you kind of nailed it there. Um, the Paranormal Podcast is where I bring on authors and experts and, and, and talk about the supernatural, and we've had, you know, just this last year has been and great. We've had some fantastic guests. We've got, we had Ben Mesrick, who wrote The 37th Parallel about UFOs, but he also wrote the movie and the book, the social network, you know, um, and uh, and uh, we've had Amy Bruni on and Nick Groff and, and, and a lot of fantastic guests uh, on that show. But on Campfire, it's basically, hey, Fred, tell me what happened to you. That's basically the concept of the show, and it's very simple. It's not elaborate. You know, I know there's, uh, you know, there's some great shows out there that use spooky music and, and sound effects and all those things. I think that's great. But mine is just basically like sitting, like it, I kind of equate it to sitting around a campfire or sitting at a bar or sitting around a family table and saying, hey, Aunt Mildred, what happened to you that time? Remember that time you always tell us about what happened? And I'm trying to recreate that beyond the show and it's just really been, you know, that show, I think, has the biggest impact on people. It really stays with them. And I think that that's what people are, are ready for. They're ready to, to get back to, you know, I just want to know what it was that I want to go back to what it was that got me interested in. it. I want to go back to what it was that scared me before I had a better understanding of it. I, I think that what happens is, you know, the, the same thing that happens to us in other mediums. We become desensitized to things and we become yeah. desensitized to the fact that when we go to this haunted location and we pull out this device the lights are going to light up and it's going to make a beeping sound like we right. we've become desensitized to that we need to get that thrill back into it and storytelling is the best way to do it yeah and the one thing that i've started in the last about year and i could kick myself for not doing this sooner is now we have kind of an online version of it too we have and this is absolutely free it's over on facebook it's called jim harold's virtual campfire and we have uh, it's not a huge group, but it's a decent-sized group. We have about 8,500 members over there, and they basically do what we do on the show. They, they'll they post. Now, this isn't like posting news stories and stuff. This is posting personal stuff. This happened to me. Here's a photo I took. Here's a video I took. Here's my story. So we're kind of rec recreating that on the virtual campfire group on Facebook. So certainly... I encourage your listeners to go over to Jim Harold's virtual campfire and join up. And we try to police it really closely so it's not Ray-Ban ads all the time. Right, yep. <laughs> and get rid of that stuff. But that's been a great experience, too. Just I think everybody, I think when it boils down to is everybody has a story, whether it's something that happened to you or happened to your best friend or happened to a parent or a loved one. I think everybody, even the skeptics, have a story. Because one of my favorite things is, uh, people will say, "Well, Jim, I don't believe in this stuff. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know about this." Now, there was this one time, <laughs> right? Yep. And everybody has that. There was this one time story, and that's that would be my goal: getting everybody's one time story. But I think that's going to be hard to do to, to get get the whole populace. But we're doing the best we can. I, I do think, though, that as people are sharing those stories and they are, you know, willing to 
admit that there is that one time in their life where they can't quite explain what goes on. It doesn't matter if they're out there having a, a ton of personal experiences themselves. What matters is that they're digesting the stories that you're telling them, that you're sharing with them, and they're willing to believe that that might have happened to somebody else. And when you take a look at how many episodes you've done, how many stories you've shared, you see this mounting evidence of the fact that, okay, these things are happening and they are happening to people. Oh, yeah. And people who are, you know, the, that are just like me. It's not a, it's not somebody who's going out and always looking for this stuff like you might exactly. hear a paranormal researcher tell you. Exactly. Now, this is not to diss ghost hunters or paranormal investigators because I've talked to many of those. I'm not one uh, in the sense of going out and, and going to locations and things. That's not what I do. But I respect what they do, and it's nothing against them. But I love the stories. And that's the, and this is the preponderance of campfire stories. We have a few paranormal investigators come on and talk about their findings and things that happen, and they're welcome any time to listen and join in. But I love the story of somebody who was driving to work and saw somebody along the side of the road and then found out months later that person had been killed months before. Or I love hearing the story of someone who found them in almost kind of a time warp situation. Um, I mean, like these true bizarre stories or something very simple, uh, simple, seeing the ghost of a loved one or maybe receiving some kind of after-death communication, but not necessarily people that have a K2 meter or, uh, you know, are, are going out and, and doing all this heavy-duty investigating. They're just living their lives and this stuff happens to them. Those are my favorite stories. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of like you can equate it to say you're into dragons and you really love stories about dragons and you read up about dragons and dragons hold an interest for you. You know, paranormal researchers are kind of like the the, the zoologists, the anthropologists, the people who tell you right. we have no actual evidence that a dragon ever existed. And when we went and investigated these stories of dragons, what we actually found were dinosaur bones. And so that's where people get misinterpreted thinking that it's a dragon. But meanwhile, you just want to hear the guy telling you the story about dragons. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes it takes some of the, I, I mean, to me, there's a serious side to it, and I'm not saying campfire isn't serious, because it is serious. I mean, I've had many people say, Jim, I've never told this story to anybody because I was afraid, or I didn't think other people would believe me, or I thought that they'd make fun of me. So there is a serious side, but there's also some fun to it, too. So I think that we can be serious, but also have a little bit of fun and, and, and share some spooky stories. Is, has there ever been a time, though, when, you, and I'm sure that, you know, you've had investigators who have come on, and they're telling you, you know, you hear a lot of these investigators tell the stories of the same reason why we don't have them on this show, just sharing their experiences, because they sound the same. They sound, you know, I went into this room, the door closed, this happened, uh, I got a spike on my K2 meter, but I'm sure you've had some paranormal researchers who have told you stories that have just made your hair stand up, and you said, it sounds like something out of a horror movie. Well, I got to tell you, we just had maybe uh, a month, about a month ago or in the last month, we had one guy that brought in some EMF, um, uh, uh, not EMF, uh, EVP mm -hmm. on the show, and we played it on the show, and it was absolutely uh, freaky. Actually, it was October 20th. The episode was Freaky EVP Campfire 283. And uh, it was some of the best EVP that I've ever heard. Now, the thing is, though, the question is, is that, um, you know, I can't vouch. I'm, I'm not saying that it's fake, but I can't say that it's absolutely real with 100% certitude because I wasn't there what was recorded. I don't know the circumstances. And then you also get into the idea of kind of audio paradelia where you, you know, <laughs> somebody tells you the tape says something or the recording i'm dating myself there and you listen and then since you're kind of programmed to believe it's something you, you kind of hear it so but there have been some great stories from paranormal investigators but in general i would say the best stories are from normal folks doing normal things when something highly abnormal happens to them and so when you're hearing all these stories, uh, you're collecting them, you're sharing them with your listeners, and then you're putting them down in written form and, and putting out these these stories. Uh, and, and, of course, you now have Volume 5 uh, has come out of the True Ghost Stories, Jim Harold's Campfire, and they're all available. You can get them all right on Amazon and all through jimharold.com. But mm -hmm. when, when you're putting all these stories down, I mean, are you 
looking at them and, and taking them at face value, are you uh, adding any kind of uh, elaboration, any kind of poetic license with them, or is this the way that you've heard these stories? No, I do not add any poetic license. What we basically do is I go through, I'll take maybe 50 episodes or 40 episodes. I'll say, okay, let's pick the 70 best stories because each book has 70 stories. Let's pick the 70 best stories from this group of episodes. Then I'll go through and check for the ones that I feel, first of all, are the most sincere, uh, where I believe, I, you know, people say, are these stories true? Well, I wasn't there, so I can't prove that the person saw what they said they saw. I can just give you my sense that Mm -hmm. they believe they saw what they said they saw, and they seem sincere to me. So that's one criteria. The other one is that's an interesting, compelling story. And then I take those, I have those stories transcribed by the great transcriptionist that we work with, and then I edit them, but only for pacing and language slightly, uh, I don't add any facts. I don't take any facts away. And um, it's basically as it's told on the, the show, except it's just edited so it'll read better. That's basically it. And the thing is, is I have some people say, well, you know, these aren't, uh, some of these stories aren't freaky enough. Well, the thing is, is that this is not a horror book. Um, now, there's qu- some quite chilling stories in the book and some really weird head scratchers and some poignant stuff, uh, but I don't change it. The story is what it is. These books are about real life. They're not about something made up by a, a great writer like a Stephen King or something like this. These are real people, and sometimes these stories have incredible Twilight Zone-like twists, but I don't add them. <laughs> Either they have them or they don't. So this this is for someone who wants to read real life accounts, not something that's uh, kind of given poetic license or anything. Now I have thought in the past, just for fun, maybe taking a small subset of the stories, using them as a basis, and then writing something off of them as a kernel, and then presenting them that way and explaining fully what they are. But these five books, as you read them, are absolutely. Uh, as told on the programs. And, and no knock on yourself as a writer, but you're probably collecting these stories and thinking to yourself, this is way freakier than anything I could have come up with on my own if I was trying to well, some you know, of do them some are. fictional I mean, stories. I, I mean, some of the, the, my favorite ones are the head scratchers. And uh, sometimes during the show, I'll tell my favorite one ever. It's not in five. I think it's in book two or three. The Roadhouse Saloon, which really does read like something out of the Twilight Zone or Night Gallery or something like that. And uh, that's one I don't think I could have made up. It would have taken a very uh, talented writer like a Rod Serling or a Stephen King or somebody like that to come up with this one. Has there been over the years as you've been collecting these stories, and, and again, as you say, you, you know, you, you accept them as having the experiences that they've told you, but I'm sure that sometimes right. they, they come at you with these stories and you're like, no, no way. There's no way that's possible. Do you do you kind of self-filter that, or do you still share that with the audience and kind of let them decide for themselves? I let the audience decide for themselves. I mean, the thing is, is that, um, you know, who am I to say? I, I mean, I had a caller one time who said that he saw a leprechaun. Uh, and this wasn't recently, this was when he was a little kid, and he said that his brother said he saw the same thing. Now, who am I to say that he didn't see something, but maybe it, you know, maybe it wasn't really a leprechaun, maybe that was some type of screen memory, you know, that's, uh, that, if folks aren't familiar with that, that's the idea that you see, you remember one thing, but it actually is a, quote, screen for some other memory. A lot of times, uh, with UFO cases or alien uh, contact cases, there's a theory, for example, people will report seeing strange birds or strange owls. What they're really seeing, supposedly, according to some uh, people, are aliens, but they have these screen memories. So who am I to Stop say that he didn't moments. see what he perceived to be a leprechaun? You know, so yeah, I mean, sometimes I think, wow, that's really out there. But again, I'm not going to say that he absolutely didn't see something very strange because I don't know. You know, and it's almost like when you hear the stories, the the stranger they are, you know, the more 
you almost kind of need those stories to be part of the mix because you need to keep expanding people's minds in what could be possible, but also having them figure out their own parameters of how much they're willing to believe as well, because that's going to suit them well when they have an experience. You know, you want to have some sort of malleability to what you feel is the realm of possibility so that if you do a, a encounter something you don't just throw up a block you don't just create a screen memory automatically you know that you're willing to accept that these things can happen to you yeah and i think uh, i think and you kind of hinted at this before about peeling back the layers and trying to figure this out and i remember when i started we started about the same time i thought oh, i'm going to do this for six months i'm going to have all this stuff figured out i'm going to get to talk to all these brilliant people like stanton friedman and brad steiger and man, I'll finally get to figure it out all for myself. I can tell you 11 years later, I have less idea of what's going on <laughs> than I did in 2005, I think. I think it's all interconnected. And the thing is, is I don't think we should necessarily, to your point, to kind of answer your comment there, I don't think we should rule anything out. Because the truth is, is I think that we only see a very small sliver of what's actually going on in the universe. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, a lot of people, times people will say, well, well, you know, the, the fact that aliens could come here and visit, that's impossible because the distances are too far. Or uh, people couldn't come back from the dead and, and, and communicate with loved ones. That's scientifically impossible. Well, I would say to them, in 1900, did science know anything about DNA? Well, no, they didn't. But did that mean that DNA did not exist? Well, no, it didn't. It did exist. We just didn't have the tools and the technique and the technology to realize that. So these things are happening very strangely. They may not be paranormal at all. They might be quite normal, but we just don't have the tools, the techniques, and the technology to measure them. That doesn't mean that they're not happening. So I think we have to be very careful when we talk in absolutes and say, well, this isn't possible, and that isn't possible. Because the truth is, is that we really don't know, and as advanced as we are with our iPhones and our HDTV and our drones, uh, we're still kind of playing with tinker toys. And um, I think there's a lot more that we don't know than we do know. And and you kind of uh, you know you kind of peeled back the curtain a little bit and showed everybody the guy operating all the levers instead of the great and powerful Wizard of Oz because that's exactly the same approach that we took with with doing this show is that you know we kind of just wanted to use it as a platform to to learn from the greater minds the ones who have been involved in this for so long and I think that mm -hmm. that's why you know your show has had so much success and 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 why people keep returning to your podcast to to get more information and more entertainment is because like us, you're not trying to lecture to people. You're not trying to tell them what they should believe and why they should believe. And you're not trying to act like you know everything. And I think that's what's been lost on a lot of people is they feel like when you get involved in this, you have to be an expert because people are going to look to you as such. Oh, you're involved in ghosts? Well, then you must know everything about ghosts. Are you involved in Bigfoot research? Well, then you must know everything about Bigfoot. I think the fact that you're willing to admit that you want to soak up this knowledge and you're there to learn and not pontificate is the key that I think a lot of these other shows have been missing over the years. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, when I have a guest on, and I guess that's why I, I hopefully can keep it fresh. I'm listening and I'm trying to learn too, just like the listener. I've got to make sure that I don't forget where I'm at. So I know when to ask the next question, but uh, I'm listening and I'm trying to learn things and all the time I learn things that I didn't know. That's why it's one of the coolest jobs ever because I get to talk to people about this all the time. Um, you know, it's it, it, it can be a little frustrating with the idea, well, will we ever have an answer? And I kind of doubt it. Uh, but I still am fascinated by asking the questions. I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> I, but there, there's so many more questions that just beget other questions. You know, it's it's yeah. it's almost like if you it's almost like if you find an answer, you're disappointed. You know, if you it's almost like if if right. if, if we figured this stuff out, it would it'd almost be a huge letdown because the pursuit of it and and it, it's a way that we can keep learning in an area that we're interested in, and our minds never stop being stimulated. 
Yeah, I guess if we figured it out, it'd be kind of like the end of a Scooby-Doo episode where they just pull the mask off of old man Johnson, who had a projector, you know. <laughs> if it weren't for you meddling kids. Um, so I guess we're kind of meddling kids in a way, now that I think of that analogy. But um, but I guess the, the, the point is, is you're right, there is a mystery and, and kind of searching for that mystery. And the thing is, is that uh, the cool thing about it is this is nothing new. I think everybody thinks this all started in, in, in the 2000s with the ghost hunting shows. But, I mean, Thomas Edison was developing or trying to develop a telephone to the dead. I mean, people have, people have wondered about this stuff and ruminated on this stuff for as long as there have been people. So, And that's another reason that I, I think there's got to be something to it. I mean, you kind of talked about before with these stories. It's just one of those things where people are having similar experiences. They have them across cultures. They have them across decades. Uh, they report them time and time and time again. And yes, um, you know, I interviewed Dr. Michael Shermer, who is probably along with James Randi. Uh, they're probably the top two skeptics, quote skeptics, uh, in in the in the world right now. And Shermer was very nice to come on the show. But I said, well, Dr. Shermer. You know, I can agree with you on a large percentage of cases. I mean, you, you have people who are mean well but are mistaken. You have people who, you know, and this does play into it, don't mean to insult anybody, but maybe people sometimes who have mental problems or maybe misreporting things, not because they're bad people, but because they have issues. And then, unfortunately, you have the worst thing, which are hoaxers, which I can't stand, and I think that, you know, they should be called out wherever possible. But then you've got some stories and some reports, whether we're talking about Bigfoot or UFOs or ghosts or whatever it might be, that can't be explained, that are put forth by people who otherwise in their lives are extremely credible. They have their feet on the ground. Um, there's no good explanation for it. How do you answer those, Dr. Shermer? And Dr. Shermer, who seemed to be a very nice guy, but he just said, well, you know, we know about that. We just put those on the shelf. And my thought on that is, why are we putting that on the shelf? We need to take that down. We need to examine that in 360 degrees and try to figure what's going on uh, in those cases rather than just say, ah, well, that's just extra data. Let's throw it out. So, so uh, you know, there is something to this stuff because the reports and the stories are very consistent and again, they cross cultures, they cross ages, they cross decades. So something is going on. Well, and what I think is the most fascinating is that even Dr. Michael Shermer has started to question his yes. own skepticism. So he's had yes, experiences. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I mentioned that on so many shows and people don't know what I'm talking about. But um, I think you're referring to an article he wrote for Scientific American uh, about an experience he had on his wedding day. And I think kind of his conclusion was something along the lines of, well, there's no other explanation other than that was a para it was paranormal, except, of course, it couldn't have been. You know, he right. <laughs> still couldn't come to grips with it. They got a little closer. And that's, that's the thing. Even he has a campfire story. Well, you had, you had kind of uh, mentioned a little bit about the the history of people being interested in the paranormal and I love to, to discuss kind of the anthropology and sociology of the paranormal community but one of the things that you had mentioned is that people have looked as far back as say Edison and even before but the I think then it was a matter of you look to these people who are pursuing this as at least those who believe looked at them as being great minds. So you have somebody like an Edison, you know, you have somebody like a Stanton Friedman, you have somebody like, uh, you know, valet, all these different people who you're looking at as being people who are, uh, well-versed in their, in their respective fields and then applying that to this pursuit. And I think that the two thousands and the glut of paranormal reality or whatever you want to call it is what made people realize, Oh, wait a minute. People just like me are out there doing this. People just like me are out there looking for this and trying to prove this. And I think that that also kind of helped to make people's experiences a little bit more palpable to see, you know, just a couple of plumbers going into a haunted house and, and coming out saying, right. I think there's something going on. Right. Yeah, I think I think it could be a two-edged sword uh, because I think some, I don't think it's, 
in some quarters it's not treated as seriously as I think it used to be. But on the other hand, I think it's accessible in the thing that I love. And, and my show is just a tiny part of it. I mean, my show is a dwarf compared to something like a Coast to Coast AM or, or a lot of the other big television shows. But even if I can uh, impact a relatively small, you know, uh, maybe if one of my shows gets 65,000 downloads, that's a really good show. Uh, but still, if I can impact that many people and have them know that it's okay to talk about your experience, um, and it's okay to say this happened to me, and you know, you shouldn't be ashamed, or you shouldn't feel that you're crazy, or shouldn't feel that you should be ostracized by society because something happened to you. Because the truth is, something happens to most people. I would say the the, the average person who lives their their full uh, life expectancy, you know, 70-something years old, whatever it is, you know, um, they in their life will have had something that we would probably category, uh, categorize as a paranormal experience. Um, not everybody is insane. Not everybody is a hoaxer. Not everybody is making this stuff up. Stuff is going on, and I know I'm kind of a broken record here with that, but uh, I think, yeah, it's become... Uh, to your point very early on in the show, it's become more acceptable to say, yeah, raise my hand, yeah, I had something weird happen to me. And that doesn't make me any less of a doctor or a lawyer or construction worker or whatever it is I do, um, a mom, a dad. Um, I'm still I'm a, I'm still a with it person. I still got, you know, <laughs> I'm still a smart person. But this happened to me, and I'm just telling you about it. And I, I think this idea that we don't have to uh, we don't have to hide it anymore is a good thing. And and as people have shared their experiences over the years, one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm sure you have as well, is that the the type of story has changed. You know, 10 years ago, we weren't talking about shadow figures. 10 years ago, you weren't getting reports of black-eyed children. You know, th these things are something that has kind of evolved, I think, as people mm -hmm. have paid more attention to the paranormal. These other types of, of reports have evolved. And, you know, whether it's just an ever-changing boogeyman or whether it's an ever-changing form that the unknown is taking in, in dealing with us human beings, these stories have been out there and, and I know that you even you have black eyed children uh, reports in, in the new book as well yeah um, uh, the the thing is is that um, it could be one of uh, a couple things it could be one that you know the skeptic will say well people see this stuff on the internet and then they either imagine it or make it up I, I don't necessarily believe that I think that people kind of Back to what you said at the beginning of the show, people are becoming more sophisticated. So maybe maybe years ago they would have called um, a shadow person a ghost. But now it's getting finer. The definitions are getting finer and more categorized. And, and people, I think, are more knowledgeable. So, you know, they're, they're distinguishing between a ghost and a shadow person or even something like a black-eyed kid. Um, the... Um, the black eyed kid story get told was from uh, I could tell it real quick maybe it was from Tony from Tennessee, and he said he lived near a college campus. He had just got an apartment there, and he said he come he came home one evening and he felt uh, incredibly uneasy. He said he usually would eat before he went to bed, but he didn't that night. He was very upset. So at about one a.m. in the morning, he heard a rapping at his door. Not a standard knock, but a rapping. He said. Now, he figured it was some drunk kids fooling around, so he had to get to work early in the morning, so he tried to forget about it and tried to go back to sleep, but it insisted and persisted. So about 2.22 a.m., it happened again. He went to the door, and he opened it, and he said it was a girl standing there, saying she was probably, he said that she was probably 13 or 14 years old, and she was looking down, not in his face, not, not eye to eye, but looking down, she said, they sent me here. And Tony said he was terrified, feeling very uneasy about this kid coming to his door and then saying this cryptic message. And he said, who sent you here? And she said, just please let me in. He said suddenly he felt cold air sweep over him and his stomach was turning. He'd never felt that way before. He opened the door all the way. And again, she said in a very emotionless, drone-like, monotone way, Please let me in. He said, look, I'll go grab a phone. You can use a telephone. Do you want to call somebody? She said, no, please let me in. They sent me here. He yelled, who sent you here? 
and added, I'm getting the phone and calling the police. He turned around, switched the light on, and she said again, let me in. And he was getting more angry. He said, no, I'm not letting you in. So she started getting extremely agitated. She kept saying, they sent me here. Then she looked up at him and said, this is only going to take a minute. Tony said that he'd never been so frightened in his life. As soon as his eyes met hers, he realized that they were entirely blacked out. Not dilated pupils, but the whole eye itself was black. He said to put him back on his heels. Then and there, he decided he was calling the police. He turned around to grab the phone, and when he swiveled back, he saw that the girl was gone. He called the police, and they laughed at him. And they said, a little girl shows up, and a grown man is worried about that? He said he didn't feel comfortable letting that child into his apartment, let alone one with completely black eyes. He says he was even afraid to share his story on the campfire. He was afraid that this girl would come back. He said by sharing, his only hope was that somebody else has an answer or possibly something that help, could help keep her away. He said these things are not children, and Tony from Tennessee says he doesn't want another visit. Well, that's and that's something that we've talked about here on the past. Uh, you know, we, we've done shows on black eyed kids and people have called in and talked about having similar experiences just a mile from where the studio is. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrifying to know. Like, I, I don't even answer yeah. the door anymore when I see it's a kid out there. I send my son yeah. over. I'm like, it's either one of your friends or they're going to get you first. One of the two. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm well, just kidding. what I want to know is what happens if uh, if the black eyed kids come in. You know, I had read somewhere, I think it was on one of the, and sometimes they're a little dubious, one of the British news sites, that uh, somebody had let a black-eyed kid in and then they ended up getting cancer. Now, again, I can't, uh, I can't uh, vouch for the veracity of that story, but I just, that's the, that's the logical question is, okay, all these people who report it, they tend to not let the black eyed kid in. What happens if you do? Well, wouldn't the campfire story answer be because the people who do let them in don't have a story to tell? That's right. You're not going to hear from them anymore. Well, that I mean, but that just goes to show, too, that uh, we we have to find new things to be afraid of. We have to, you know, as as things have been creeping us out over time, we have to find new ways and create new ways to scare ourselves. I mean, we can, cre and we can do that. Uh, just look at Slenderman as a perfect example of something that, you know, has freely been admitted as something that has been created. And we know the person that created it. We know the whole background of it, but it's taken on a life of its own. And now it's become something that has gone beyond just being a story and it's become an actual living, breathing urban legend. Well, here's something that's interesting. There's two possibilities there. And I would direct people to the work of David Weatherly, who's done a lot on black eyed kids, but also on this other subject of tulpas. Um, you take something like Slenderman, <coughs> excuse me, and the idea that it was created out of whole cloth and then this whole urban legend cropped up uh, among it. And of course you had that one very tragic situation with the, uh, the, the girls who, and the victimization and all of that. And that's horrible. But then you hear of these new things being talked about, and then they start to manifest. David has also done some very interesting work in the idea of tulpas. And uh, I have a premium uh, site, which I don't direct new listeners to listen to all the free stuff. But as part of that, we did a uh, webinar with him. And he talked at length about tulpas, and he's written on tulpas. Uh, T-U-L-P-A-S, if, if people out there aren't familiar with them. The idea that somebody can almost, by their thoughts, conjure something up. So not just the act of making it up and making up stories and having other people make up stories that aren't based in fact. There is a line of thinking, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but I find it fascinating, that somebody can think of some kind of monster or some kind of object and can give it physical life. A now that's out there. Now that's out there. But again, we're in the business of mind expansion and maybe looking at things in a different way. And that's really a different way. This whole kind of, it's a very kind of Eastern idea um, that things can be conjured up and created. 
uh, not just, again, on the words on a page, but actually you can think of something and it can manifest. Uh, and some of these things aren't very nice, apparently. So uh, it's an interesting thought experiment, if nothing else. Well, you have the, the, the old theories of the golem that in Jewish yeah. tradition. Yeah. And we talk about it like here locally to put a, a local South Coast spin on it. I, you know, when I go out and I lecture about Lizzie Borden, I tell people all the time, it's entirely possible that that house was never haunted until it became a bed and breakfast. And people started going in every day and talking about the murders and assuming that it would be haunted because of what went on there. And that the people who have gone in there looking for these ghosts might have been what ended up creating these ghosts. And that's why they do the type of things that they do and, and they interact with people the way they do, because it's something that we've created and we put out there rather than just being, you know, the, the spirit of a deceased person. Yeah. And the person is not being disingenuous in any way. It's just that their thoughts have, have manifested whatever this is. Right. The, yeah, so, the, the experience is real. It's just where it came from is different than what we believe. Yeah. Well, another example of uh, something like that, where maybe we're creating things or, or things have a different explanation. For example, let's talk about psychics. Now, um, I can tell you a story that happened to me about a psychic that was fascinating. I had a psychic on one of my shows, and this has got to be several years ago, very early on. Her name is Carol Obley, and she's out of the uh, Pittsburgh area. And she's been on the show several times. And my general thought is with skeptics is not skeptics, psychics is is that I believe some people can have psychic powers, but I think you have to be cautious just because I think there's also the opportunity for a lot of chicanery uh, and dishonesty, unfortunately, you know, preying upon people and those things. So I'd never had Carol on the show before. And I said, well, I'm just curious. So I have my wife call into the show, but not identify herself. Now, my wife is not active on social media. She hates Facebook. Um, and, and she's rarely, if ever, been on the shows, maybe to say a Christmas uh, happy holidays or something like that. But very much not, not uh, uh, doesn't have a high profile online. No way for Carol to research her. But we didn't tell Carol that it was her. We just used her first name and said she was calling into the show, and this was a caller, and we had several people. I wasn't trying to trap Carol. I just was curious to see what would happen. And, um, you know, Carol, I've got Dar on the line, and she wants to see who's coming through, who are you seeing. And um, she said, oh, I see this younger person uh, about her age, a contemporary who has passed in a very sudden way. His name's Bob or Robert, and he just wanted to say hello. Well, Carol would have had no way of knowing that uh, my wife, her best friend in high school was named Bob, who committed suicide. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so that, that blew me away. And I know people say you remember the hits and forget the misses, but that was amazing. But my point is, what I was going to say is, is, if you frame things in the way you think about them, I, I was thinking about this, and I know it's not an original thought, but for example, when somebody gets a psychic reading, you know, is it possible that the psychic, unbeknownst to them, is not tapping, onto the, uh, tapping into the other side, but actually reading the mind of the person that they are doing the reading for. So in the example I just gave you, is it possible that Carol, unbeknownst to her, and I'm not saying this is the case, I'm just asking the question, is it possible she read my wife's mind but interpreted it as a message from the other side? Jim, I, I don't can... know. Maybe, maybe my wife was looking for that message. I don't know. I'm just thinking that we've got to, when we look at these things, Sometimes we got to look at them from other angles rather than just, oh, a ghost is a dead person. I, you know, I, the obvious angle. Go ahead. I, I would say I could give you my opinion on that, but I think it would probably be better if I turned it over to my co-host, Stephanie, who is both a psychic and a medium and might be able to offer at least some insight in, into what you're describing. Oh, that's great. So um, what you're describing, reading minds and connecting to the other side are actually two completely separate gifts. Um, psychic deals with people's 
energies um and if you can delve really deep into psychic phenomenon you get things like telepathy um telekinesis psychometry different things like that so telepathy what you're talking about would be a psychic gift um that is totally separate from being a medium medium solely connect to the other side and connect to um, people that have passed on so um we say in this world at least that every psychic is psychic every medium is psychic but not every psychic is medium so um she would have had to explain to you what her gifts specifically are in order to determine so, the difference between what so you're looking for. So for Jim and I, we might have that question, but for you or or Carol as the as the people with the gift, yeah. you would be able to sense the difference between which one you were actually using. Right. So, um at least speaking for myself, I can read anybody's mind sitting in the room right here, you know, but not every psychic has that gift. Um Right. But connecting to the other side actually you know takes me completely out of my logical mind um and i solely connect to, to those on the other side i often do not remember what i say and i talk really fast um and you know it it happens for a short amount of time so you can actually see like the physical difference in me from when i start to when i finish um so could she have been reading your wife's mind um it would have had to uh, been a pretty good read and especially you know if she wasn't present with her um right. in person it, oh i was very impressed and this is by no means to be yeah. a negative of oh, no. carol she's been on our show quite a few times afterwards and i'm always very impressed with her and she seems to be incredibly sincere and a genuinely good egg i just um, i was just using that as an example now uh, that example aside you you don't think there's ever the chance that maybe there is the misinterpretation um, I mean, is it that clear that this is coming from the other side? This is coming from uh, this person I'm sitting with from their mind. It's very clearly delineated. For myself, um, I can at least speak for myself. And I, I've had this gift passed down to me from generation to generation. Um, it's something that I, I have never lived without. For those that have gone to classes and tried to hone in on abilities, it might be different for them. But for me specifically, um, when I connect psychically, I can look at somebody and tell them something and like almost as like a, you know, a party joke because I can do it that easily. Connecting to the other side takes an extreme amount of effort. Um, I usually tell people um, it feels very similar to the worst anxiety attack that you could ever have in your life. Your heart is pumping, you're Ooh. sweating, um, and you can't come down off of that very easily um so it's not something that's easily done um and can be you know just thrown around it's something that i have to put it like complete concentration into and to make sure that you know i tell people i can go for about two to two and a half hours if i have to do a gallery reading or readings back to back um and i can only take x amount because it, it takes a physical toll on you so psychic is very easy for me i should say um mediumship uh, physically is a little bit more difficult. So I know the difference between both, but maybe others don't, especially if they're not familiar with their gifts. Well, thank you for that insight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, and, and that's what I think is the most fascinating about it is, you know, when you're talking about tulpas, when you're talking about these creations, I don't think I've ever heard... I mean, at least in our conversation, Stephanie, and the other psychics and mediums that we've mm -hmm. had on the show, I don't think I've ever heard anybody be able to tell me, though, if it was something that we created or something that was uh, an actual deceased person, if there wasn't a, a connection. You know, they can always tell you if, if you're connecting with somebody that has a history. You, you know right. what I mean? Like when you're in a house and you know that this house has a spirit attached to it, you pick up on that. But right. if we're going into something you know, blind, it's very hard for you to tell, at least early on, what the nature is of the spirit is that you're dealing with. As you're saying it, I'm wondering, because, um, you know, you've been with me to different places, and we've come across things that we would c probably classify easily as a residual energy. Could that be a tulpa? If it's not intelligent and it's not communicating back and forth, could that be a tulpa or are tulpas intelligent? I mean, Jim, what do you think? Do you think that, you know, at least in, in what the discussions that you've had and what you've looked into into tulpas, are they are they actually something that can interact and communicate with you? Or is it just an energetic recording, an energetic imprint that we're leaving somewhere? No, I, I think uh, talking with David and David is, uh, I mean, I'm. I'm sure, I'm guessing you're familiar with David Weatherly. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. He he's, certainly he's, shouldn't. Yeah, of he's course. He's been on the show. And uh, 
Yeah, I figured so. Um, he's the expert, but I will say this is that in my discussions with him, the answer is yes. I, I mean, they're physical entities. So sensibly they could communicate, I would think. I mean, um, I'm sure they could take on more kind of ethereal forms, but, uh, but I think they are physical. And uh, again, it's one of those things where I, I'm kind of in the area, and I kind of laugh at this. I'm kind of like the, um, the guy who knows a, a little bit about a lot of different things. So I don't really, it's your point earlier when you were talking about not claiming to be an expert. I don't claim to be an expert. Certainly I've developed opinions over the years, uh, but I defer to these heavy duty researchers who really know their subjects. So I'm really one of those generalists. I know a little bit about a lot of this stuff. And, and um, but you've got to go to those guys to get the, the straight scoop on it. And I will say, though, that I'm, I'm probably guilty of, of putting you in this position, though, because I love to pick the brains of other people who are generalists like myself because you're not locked. You know, if we have somebody on who comes on as a as a guest, they usually have a viewpoint, and a perspective and an right. idea and a concept and a theory. And I love to pick the, the brains of other hosts to see, you know, what kind of little things have you picked up and gleaned? Because we're talking to a variety of different opinions and mindsets were as opposed to you know sometimes monies you know this with ufo researchers uh, they get locked into it and they say no that, no this that is the way tunnel they vision yes. where they only see this yes i know exactly what you mean and and so That's, with mm -hmm. i'm sorry i was in, go ahead jim no 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 i just agree fully with that i think people get so locked into their way of looking things they don't look any other way and that must be what's so great about collecting these campfire stories, putting them out in the in the new book and the previous books as well. Is you're you're getting these stories from people who aren't filtering them through, you know, That's any, right. any type of certain mindset or any type of lens that they think that you'll buy into. You know, they're giving you just the raw story. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, the the thing is, and they're so diverse in their stories. You know, um, I will constantly. A couple weird things happen with the campfire show. One of the weird things is into a story and say, okay, let's say that Betty from New Jersey is calling. And uh, I get her online. I'm like, she's going to tell me a story like so many other stories I've heard. And she'll floor me with something totally out of the left field that I've never heard before. So there's always new and exciting content and, and stories and, and things that are unique. There's always something new. Is, uh, it feels like I've been doing this a long, long time, and there's always something new and unique. And here's the other weird thing that, that happens on the show. And this uh, maybe this is this kind of meta, but this might even be kind of paranormal too. So on a typical night, I'll take seven or eight calls from different people and, and record their stories, and then I assemble it later for a show. There's no, usually there's no rhyme or reason I don't say I'm going to do calls on this date about UFOs or this date about visits from loved ones or this date about shadow people. I just call in with whatever your story is, whatever it is. I'm glad to accept it and, and share it. And I'll find many nights I'll have three or four calls about similar things. Like the show almost wants to produce itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I find that to be very, and, and it's not like traditional radio where people can hear callers before them and then say, oh, well, that person told that call. I'll call. These people are signing up unaware of what the other people are talking about. And I always find that kind of weird. It, but it is. It's almost like there is that outside guiding force. There's been weeks when we've had, you know, no guest plan. Or a guest is canceled out on us and we just come in and, you know, we'll just start kicking things around. And then we hit on something and and that seems to take over the conversation. And then people will message us you know, the next day like, hey, you know, that was a very interesting show. And we were like, we were just kind of, you know, fumbling around in the dark looking for the light switch. But then when it came on, you know, it, it illuminated everything. And I think that there is when you talk about these topics, there is something a little bit you know, a little bit greater than us that, that will take over and, and will kind of guide the direction from time to time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. And the thing is, and I'm sure you've had this experience, the other thing that's really gratifying about the shows is people will say things like, the show helped me through a tough time. And I'm always amazed by that because, you know, um, I look at it as one part education, one part entertainment, right? 
I don't ever think that it it helps anybody in any way, but uh, but you know somebody will say you know it helped me come to terms with my experiences. But then I'll have things like you know I was taking chemotherapy and I listened to the shows while it was happening, and I'm sure you as long as you guys have been on, you've had the same thing that um, you know you never know how you touch people, and I hope that I always am a good short of that and, and, and try to uh, uh, to make life a little better for people, whether it's just uh, hearing a spooky story or it's something deeper for them. I hope that some way, you know, because I love the fact I can do this full time. I love the fact that this is my job, uh, but I also hope that it does a little bit of good, too. And if that's helping somebody get their story out or maybe having a little bit better commute to work or maybe helping with them through something as, as terrible as a tragedy, something they can take their, their mind off their troubles for an hour, um, that feels real good, too. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's all about being able to give people a voice, uh, either the, the listener who wants somebody who is willing to listen to them or the guests who want to come on and share their point of view and share their perspective. And what I always find to be the most fascinating is not just the people that you're talking about, the people who it touches them and it impacts them, but the people who almost resist it and the people who become listeners because somebody else is listening. And, you know, I, I recently did a lecture in, in uh, one of the towns around here on the South Coast and a husband and wife couple came up to me afterwards and said, she listens to your show every week. And then the wife mm-hmm. looked at me and said, well, he listens too, but he doesn't believe it. And he just looked at me and he goes, no, I told her at the beginning I didn't believe it. I believe it now. Oh, and, that's cool. <laughs> and that's that's what matters because it's somebody who said never went out and pursued this, never had an experience, but just was convinced by listening to other people share their stories, whether it be guests or callers, to say, okay, listen, if this many people are having these experiences, then I have to put something into it. And that's what the people who listen to your show and the people who read your books will be able to come away from with it is to say, wait a minute, these stories, as fantastic as they seem, the people that are having these things happen to them seem pretty normal. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 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 thing is, is that um, it's interesting too how different people are because I think people would think because I do these shows, for example, that I'm sensitive, and um, I'm not sensitive at all. I mean, I've had a couple of experiences, but nothing that that is dramatic as what a lot of people or as frequent as, as a lot of people have had. I like to joke I'm sensitive as a board. So when I hear people, uh, I have a story in the book called Uncle Gene Sees Dead People. And it's by Jaime in Alabama. And I'm always amazed when I hear about people who do see these things and pick up on these things uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, had the, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm just pressing some buttons uh, as we That's all right. go back onto the air. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, I, I, I love this story. I'll tell it real quickly because it was kind of humorous. Uh, he said his uncle Gene worked in a factory. And one day he saw a man staring at one of his co-workers, Gene's co-workers. And uh, didn't know what he was doing. He's kind of looking at him while he was working. He was a little bit older man. And Gene walks over to the guy and says, uh, may I help you? And he points over to Gene's co-worker and says, oh, I'm here to see here. But it uh, see him, but he looks like he's busy. Just uh, tell him his father came by, would you? And Gene's like, oh, okay. So a couple days later, uh, Gene sees this guy. Didn't think much of it at the time. And he said, oh, by the way, I wanted to let you know your, your father came over the other day and, and was going to talk to you, but you look like you were busy, so uh, he left. He said, what did he look like? And... The guy was so freaked out, he pulled out a picture. He said, was this him? Was this him? And Gene goes, yeah, that's him. He said, I don't know how to tell you, Gene, but my father's been, that's a picture of my father. He's been dead for two years. Uh, And apparently, Uncle Gene saw a lot of dead people, and he would see them in full body, um, just as if it were you or me. 
Uh, and to me, that's fascinating that there's people walking around with that that have those kind of abilities. And I do believe that there are people who are more sensitive to these things. I think I tend to be one of those people who's not that sensitive, which is ironic because I do what I do. You would think I would be more sensitive, but I joke that I'm as sensitive as a board. That's, you know, I used to say the same thing, though, and I think that the more time that I've spent, well, I mean, also, you know, you mentioned you don't put yourself out in these places, and I think I've, you know, I'm running different events and, and being involved in different right. investigations, like I put myself, I think you almost kind of can't help it when you're around it. It's like, right. you know, if you if you smell, you know, garlic cooking enough, then you know what the smell of garlic is right. without, just by thinking about it. And yeah, so, I think there's truth to that. And, and but the other side of it too, though, is that you you almost you have to have some sensitivity to it to be able to have it hold your interest. I mean, you can't be completely closed off to it and have it still envelop your life and still become such a major part of who you are if you're not at least somewhat sensitive to these experiences. I think the word for me is inquisitive. I'm I've always was like that since I've been a little kid. It's like if I get interested in a topic, really interested, uh, even before, you know, I'm dating myself, I'm in my 40s, but before the Internet, I would go to the library and get out every book. I would get out a dozen books on that topic and try to read them all. Um, so I'm kind of like that. If I'm interested in something, I want to know everything I can about it. And I am – people – one thing that makes me kind of laugh is um, – People say, oh, boy, you were you were smart to get on, on this paranormal craze, and that was a good business move. And I kind of laugh at that because I'm like, boy, I must have really been good because when I was seven years old, I was like couldn't wait every week until Leonard Nimoy uh, came on in search of. And I was reading Charles Berlitz's, uh, like books on the Bermuda Triangle when I was in grade school. Boy, I must have really been smart business-wise because I was doing it way back then. So I just was born with an interest in this. And I also think that it also went back to my family, and maybe some way this kind of inspired the campfire. There are a couple great supernatural stories in my family. My dad uh, had them both. One was with my late mom, and she swore by the story, too. Uh, they had gone to, this was when I was a little baby, and um, they had dropped me off at my grandparents. They were actually out of state and visiting with my grandparents. So I was staying with the grandparents. They went off to this secluded area. I don't want to know why. <laughs> right. But anyway, it was back in the sticks. And uh, they were parked. My dad said they saw a large flash in the sky. And then he turned and there was a man in what he called a welding mask who held his hand up. And then at that point, my dad said, uh, we're going to get the H out of here. And he, uh, he spun out. He had a big 68 with Sabre, and he was tooling down these uh, old dirt roads. And then my mom said they saw the biggest birds on the side of the hill uh, coming out of this place that she ever saw in her life that had this huge wingspan. And you have to know, well, my dad's still with us, thankfully. He's a, he was a steel worker salt of the earth kind of guy, did not uh, sleep with a pyramid under the bed, didn't know anything about chakras, <laughs> you know, nothing like that. Uh, and my mom, who has passed, but was much the same way, uh, and they swore to it, they've sworn to it uh, every day since then. I mean, my mom, until she passed, always told the story. My dad uh, told the story, and it was virtually identical. Uh, and then he had another great ghost story uh, that happened with he and my uncle. And maybe hearing those stories as a real little kid kind of made me more sensitive and fascinated into it. I often wonder if that's the case, if that kind of got me started uh, on the road to this kind of most unusual career. You know, you you mentioned the, the beginning of the craze, and, and you mentioned Berlitz. And I remember walking into a flea market a couple of years ago, and they had a hard cover of the the Bermuda Triangle book, and it was seventy five dollars for this beat up hard oh cover gosh. book. And I was like, I remember getting that same exact book, and probably the same exact. It might even have been the exact same book that I had, and right. I got it at a yard sale for fifty cents. You know, right. <laughs> back in the late eighties, early nineties, and now you know yeah, because now of the, the interest. Item. Yeah. 
Exactly. Well, you know, the internet helps with that too. Uh, you know, we, yeah. we, we, I must have thrown away if, cause I used to go to yard sales and, and collect all kinds of old books and I must have thrown away hundreds of books that now would, you know, go for three or $400 online that you just yep. can't find anywhere. You know, these great colonial ghost stories and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I wish right? I had kept that stuff. We all have regrets like that. Hey. Well, the good thing though, is that if people want to get some books right now that they can read and enjoy they can get the, all the the campfire stories if and if you go to uh, jimharrell.com or if you go to amazon you can just look up the books the entire true ghost story series is all right there for you to buy you can get it right on your kindle which i think is mm -hmm. uh you know talking about the technology that's evolved over the years i think that's the best because people who are still on the fence about reading about this stuff they can download it on their kindle and sit in a public place and read it and nobody's going to come up to you and be like why are you reading yeah. that stuff yeah, no, I mean, also, there's the economics of it. I mean, you can get uh, each of my Kindle books for $2.99. Mm -hmm. So you can literally get the whole uh, collection for like 15 bucks, which is like 350 stories. So if you're really into this. And the thing is, is that um, if you're into true stories that have happened to real people, um, I think they're pretty good. I mean, we've done well with them. They've been each one of them at a different time or another has been a Kindle number one bestseller, and we keep doing them because people keep buying them and say that that, that they want more. So we're going to keep uh, we're going to keep on keeping on. Now, with with uh, all the different podcasts that you have, you have different things that you put out, different special projects, different uh, regular projects. Uh, they can get it all through jimharrell.com, and they can subscribe there and get access to uh, everything that you've ever done. Yeah. Um, basically, the way it works, I have the Paranormal Podcast and Jim Harold's Campfire, and those are the free shows, and you can get the most recent 90 days of content absolutely free. Never have to pay a penny. You can get that from here until I stop doing the shows, which is hopefully many, many years from now. If you listen to all, you know, 25 free shows or whatever's up there and you say, boy, I really like this stuff, I'd like to get, uh, you know, 1,100 more, 1,200 more shows like that, then you can check out my Plus Club and uh, the, the, you go to jimherald.com, it'll be obvious how to get to my Plus Club. And uh, there you can get, again, uh, over 1,200 shows, including the Archive of the Campfire, the Archive of Paranormal Podcasts, a bunch of exclusive shows that have never been free. But I always recommend if you've never heard of me or my podcast, don't even worry about that paid stuff. Just uh, if you want to pick up a Kindle book, great. Uh, and then listen to the free podcast to jimherald.com. You can find it on iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever fine podcasts are heard. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, and I know it's like trying to pick a favorite child, uh, but going back and looking at all the shows that you've done, all the people that you've had the access to talk to, who was somebody that was uh, you know, a great get in your mind, somebody that you couldn't wait to talk to, and, and who was somebody that you kind of came away with uh, thinking you could talk to them uh, you know, forever? My favorite guest, and this is tough to do, is Brad Steiger. Um this guy has been doing this longer. Uh, people aren't familiar. They should be. Uh, he's been writing on this stuff since the 50s and 60s. Uh, I believe he's in his 70s now. Just has a, I mean, he has a great manner of speaking, and he's just, he's a great storyteller. Um, but he's seen it all. He's written about it all. Uh, he continues to write. Um, and just somebody I could just sit and talk about this stuff for hours because he's extremely, you can mention anything and he knows it and he's covered. He, you know, I love, you know, some people are very siloed. There's like, oh, I'm just interested in UFOs or I'm just interested in ghosts or I'm just interested in cryptids. I'm a big tent guy. I'm interested in all this stuff. Some more than others, but I'm interested in all of it. And Brad is like that and he is a legend. And just to get the opportunity to interview him once was an honor, let alone probably at least half a dozen times over the years. And he's always very nice to me and very complimentary. So that's a great relationship and a great honor. Uh, so I guess he probably has to be my favorite guest of all time. But there's a, been a lot of great guests. And uh, uh, I really enjoy getting to talk to Ben Mesrick. That was an honor. I mean, one of the top authors in America today in any genre. And really heartening to see somebody like that 
on the New York Times bestseller list who is taking notice of the UFO phenomenon and, and saying, hey, we need to take this seriously. It's not just uh, something to laugh, out, uh, laugh at on the 6 o'clock news and play X-Files music. So that, that was, that was, I would say that was a great get. I think I was the first person to interview him on that book, and he was on CBS this morning and the Today Show, and, uh, and to be the first, I just coincidentally, the first person to interview him on, uh, on that, uh, that was pretty cool. You know, I mean, I, I can tell you that really the whole reason I wanted to start doing this is so that I could geek out and talk to some people that I've always wanted to talk to. And, yeah, and the, I mean, hey. <laughs> the crew can tell you, like, there was, you know, you can tell, like, when we have Jim Mars on the show, like, I come Jim in Mars and I'm like, great. I'm like, oh my God, we could, we could talk to Jim Mars tonight and, uh, and, and our Gary Patterson, who I will just, you know, I don't yep, even ask fantastic. questions. I just have him tell oh, stories. Fantastic. And, and oh. Stephanie, we made your dream come true when we had you James did. and Prague on. And, and we need to do that again. And it turned into you studying under him, so it worked yes. out well. Yes, it did. I talked to James about Brock. He was everybody you've mentioned are, are like some of the best guests. Our Gary Patterson, I just had him on recently. Richard Sirrett mm -hmm. um, had referred him because they were doing a thing up in Toronto. And Sirrett is great. I mean, he does guest hosting for Coast to Coast. He's fantastic. A really kind of underappreciated guy. But uh, our Gary Patterson could talk to him for hours about rock and roll curses and legends just great stuff and you know that and that's what it's all about it's all about being able to sit here and and learn and be entertained and hopefully that the audience enjoys that ride as well and, and it seems like your audience certainly does and it seems like it's growing every day you know more as more and more people are looking for this and and trying to find more information all they do is type in paranormal podcast into google and what comes up the paranormal podcast and then they yes, find all your yes, other work I, as well i i think that was the best thing i ever did when i started i'm like <laughs> what should i name this show it's paranormal podcast but somebody has to have that name this is back in 2005 and i'm like nobody has that name oh yes they do i do now but uh, that's been a great stroke of luck and that really october was our best month ever uh, it would have, I thought we were going to hit a record with 600,000 downloads. We actually did hit a record, but it was with 700,000 downloads. So, wow. And a lot of those people are sticking around for uh, November. So uh, I, do feel, I was afraid that you know, podcasts are becoming so popular that a uh, little guy like me was going to get edged out. But I think, I think it's working the opposite way. I think we're getting new people. So it's really exciting. It's an exciting time to do this. Well, you know, the cream rises to the top. And, and a very little known fact about this show is the original title of this show was going to be Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. But we found out that was already taken. <laughs> so I had to go with the spooky South Coast route. But I just, I think we would have probably had a lot more listeners right at the beginning if we'd gone with that. Maybe yeah, a few more lawsuits as well. They were all lawyers. That would have helped. <laughs> Well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, and thank you for you know keeping the perspective that you have for all these years, uh, and and making sure that when people are learning about this, that they also understand you know it's also about just getting together and and talking and conversing and keeping the subject going, and and sometimes we'll find the answers, and sometimes it's better if we don't. And that's true, and I want to congratulate you guys. I'm going for so many years too, and it's just great to see people like you guys, and I hope to me to some extent we stick with it, we keep with it because we really love it. It's not just about money or or whatever. It's about really being interested in stuff, and it's good to see that there's there's people out there who are genuinely interested in it, and they're in it for the long haul. And it's also good to know that if it ever all goes away, we can always just talk to each other, Jim. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and you have a great night. You too, thanks. Bye. That is Jim Harold. He is the host of the Paranormal Podcast, Campfire Stories, uh, many other podcasts, all available for you at jimharold.com and, of course, all of his books as well. See, guys, the, I like talking to other hosts. I like talking to other people who uh, kind of take a smorgasbord of the paranormal and of the subject matter. And, and one thing about Jim, we didn't really touch on this, uh, but Jim isn't defining the paranormal with a subject matter you know what do i always say when we when we talk about should we talk about a topic or not don't i always say kind of anything goes we can talk about whatever we want yeah for years and and that's the same approach that jim takes that i think you know a lot of other people look at the the possible guest list and say yeah i don't know i don't, I don't think so but 
I think if you're doing this job and you're doing it right, you say, yeah, sure. And if you don't think that it fits, you say, well, how can we make it work? You know, like we put out a few rules about, you know, like we're not going to feature groups because that's just for the entertainment value for the listener. That's about keeping the conversation. Well, we have done done new direction in the past, but that mainly pertain to particular cases, I believe. Right. And but we we've you know, and we still will stick to that rule. If there's an interesting case or if there's an interesting level of experience uh, or a, a field of study, a field of focus that a group can lend information and lend insight on, then sure, we would have them on. But, you know, it, we, we've been able to go away, thankfully, from the shows of being, well, tonight it's Acme Paranormal Group and let's talk to them. Well, tell us about how you got involved. What are your best experiences? You know, because that kind of stuff just it's gets repetitive. repetitive. It, it well, does. And, and they all, it's like you're psychic or something. <laughs> And not to mention, Acme Paranormal Group and every other paranormal group out there probably has their own podcast now where they talk about that because stuff anyway. the internet opened that up for everybody. So there's no need to keep rehashing that uh, just because, you know, there's like, uh, I guess if you want to say Spooky South Coast uh, has a large reach, then if you're going to have a large reach then what's the point of having them come on and tell all this stuff to direct people to go listen to their podcast where they're just going to hear the same stuff that they just heard on the show? You know, it's, it's, I've always wanted to try and look at things from a way that's going to keep it entertaining for the listener and also keep it entertaining for the guest. I don't want you to come on the show and have us all ask the same questions that you've heard everywhere else. You know, that's why, like... If somebody says, wow, that's a great question. I've never been asked that before. I'm secretly doing a little yes inside because that's what I want. I want it to be worth it for them to come on and have this conversation. And, you know, we're not, we're not about coming on and promoting something. We're about coming on and promoting discussion. Promoting new ideas. Like you said, you, nobody's ever asked me that before. Th- then that's fresh information that has now been shared. And it gives you the opportunity to pontificate on something that you might not have had that chance before, or maybe even, maybe you don't have an answer ready and it makes you, it makes those gears grind a little bit harder, whatever, you know, that's great. That's what I think is the important part. And that's, you know, we, you know, you've seen the conversations, the the message threads we have going back and forth with Chris, right? Let's book this guy. Why? Mm -hmm. Why not? Are you sure? But that's the challenge of it. The challenge of it is like I think I have to that admit that there's one coming up that I may have questioned. Wh- wh- which one is that? The seventeenth. Uh, is 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 that the big guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. see, no, you're gonna have so much fun that night. I promise. I think so. I haven't even looked up anything on the guy. Seriously, we're nope. just going in blind. Yep, we're just going in blind. I, awesome. I don't even want to. Those know turn out in. to be sometimes our best shows. This, you're gonna <laughs> like this one. We'll tell you. We'll tell you off air who it's gonna be. Well, actually, I mean, it's booked, right? It's booked. It, you tell me. Is it booked? Chris said it was booked. So, uh, we're, are we sure it's booked? We we're talking about the 17th of December. Yep. Just prior to Christmas, we're gonna have the birthday boy himself on, on Spooky South. We're gonna talk to Jesus. Okay. We have booked Jesus Christ for Spooky South Coast. Yep. The reincarnated Jesus Christ. He is he is back. I'm sorry, I should say I should not say reincarnated. That's incorrect. The resurrected Jesus Christ will be on Spooky South Coast. Those are two very different R words. They well, are. I, I that's my own resurrected. But I it, thought he yeah. ascended, so wouldn't he technically return? No, he did resurrect. Well, it, right, but then right. ascended. Right. So is he re re I don't know what's happening. He is back like John Wick. He is coming back with a vengeance. He is coming back to, I don't know exactly why he's back, but. You just have to promise that there will be no raptures that night. Uh, so you saying you don't want me to play the Blondie song? No, and I'm not drinking the special Kool-Aid. Good. Oh, we were going to have the purple Kool-Aid. We were all <laughs> going to wear our, our, our Nikes, our purple Nikes. We were all going to come in ready to go. What is happening? Uh-huh. No, we're we're going to have Jesus Christ on the show. Um, okay. And well, I'm sure we will get angry phone calls. Uh, I hope yep. uh, there better not be a college football. If there is that night, I think that it's like it's the law that if if it's Jesus, you have to you have to circumvent the football and you have to broadcast over that, right? Matt Costa is there is you went to school for this stuff. You would know better than I. You're the only person in the room. Is it an FCC law? Uh, is it one of the bylaws, Article 14, subsection right. C, paragraph yep. D, that if Jesus Christ wants airtime on the radio, we don't have to play the football? Um, Unless it's Notre Dame. I, I think it's fine, yeah. Okay. 
I'm right. sure he can just, you know, whip up a lightning bolt and... No, let's not... Let's, let's hope not, because right now it can be like, they're mocking me. No. No. If I recall correctly about rules of airtime, now doesn't is the devil in? get equal airtime? We're not in equal time season. Is it coming in, or is he over the... No, it'll be over the phone. Well, listen, I'm crazy. I'm not that crazy. <laughs> Although we have had Jesus in the studio, just Fairhaven Jesus. So mm. what I heard was we have to have Satan on next. I think he sent me a friend request <laughs> on Facebook earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't know if we'll be booking him or not. But uh, all joking aside, we keep things interesting, and obviously we are giving everybody an equal opportunity to come and share their story. So it may or may not get interesting. And if it's ever listen, if it goes bad. It's on, I guess, me more than anybody. Yep. Because I'll be the main questioner, and also I'm the one that pushed for it. So, right. You know, if it goes bad, I'll 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 take the blame. But I'll like just breaking down the fourth wall a little bit for the listener. Like we have to keep things interesting for us too. Right. Like we have to be invested and interested in the topic. And there's some nights that we come in here, and I'm like, I don't even know where we're going to go with this tonight. <laughs> Like, right. But no, no, not in a way well, of like, I have no idea where this is going to go. Like those nights are exciting. But sometimes you come in and you look at the daunting task of we're going to cover this topic for two hours and I hope that we can stretch it for that long. Right. You know, and but there's other nights when you just walk in and you're like, how are we going to cover all this stuff in two hours? Yeah. And, you know, we could be walking into a time bomb that's going to blow up on our face uh, 15 minutes into the interview. AKA Commander Sani Sido Part Two. I was say, yeah. Has or, that happened? Or hmm. we could be walking into something that we come away with saying, like, what just happened? My I don't know, no. but it was awesome. <laughs> you know, so hey, you know, that's you never know where it can go. And that's that's what makes it interesting for us and hopefully makes it interesting for the listeners as well. So I like how everybody's guessing who the birthday boy would be for December seventeenth. Which is hysterical. Right. It's it's not Beethoven. Uh, it's it is, not Jimmy Puffett. It is not Cat Commander <laughs> Commander Sonny Cito. Uh and it's it, it's not Isaac Newton. If it was if it was Jimmy Buffett, you know, that's I don't like his music. It would I'm be a not, challenge for me. Yeah. But I could probably get through an, an interview with Jimmy Buffett. I but. feel like you could interview anybody. I just I look at it as like if you make a bunch of songs about drinking in the beach, everybody's gonna like them. So it's it's not really, you know, Right. It's not genius. And cheeseburgers. I was going to say cheeseburgers. We have to eat cheeseburgers. I'm just starving, so <laughs> Right. This, this I'm going to end up talking for the last 3 minutes about Taco Bell. This is uh this is going that's where we're going. Well, that's the thing is we're broadcasting on the internet. We don't have to talk for 3 more minutes. Oh, that's true. We could just cut so it right now. So what you're telling me time. is I could cut out right now and go drive and get, get cheesy gordita crunches. You could get you No, you have to try the steakhouse burrito. I don't You know how I am about steak. It's a love-hate relationship. I might go buy one just to give you a bite of it. Listen, so let's get in my car and phenomenal. go right now. It was phenomenal. It was really good. Ready go. All right. So uh that does do it for this week. We're not just ending the show because we want Taco Bell. We're <laughs> It's literally the end of the show. Uh but uh we want to thank you for joining us. I'm trying to look and see uh if we have uh, next week booked, Chris is uh, in the chat room. He can let us know. I did he's, not see that. He's sending messages. Oh, the stream is really behind, too. So right, no, I might not know. So I meant from Chris. I don't remember. So it's we don't know what's going on yet. But no, we don't. Know. It's a mystery. And uh, so we'll be back next Saturday night. I believe we'll be over the radio, uh, and hopefully that will help. Matt, you think that it was the the weather that was playing havoc with the stream tonight? Um. It could be. I don't know. It happened last time. It was, uh, we had some yeah, bad we had weather. Yeah, like a weird storm coming so. in. We'll and sort it out next week. Well, the weather or the internet? <laughs> well, Both. If Jesus is on. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Because, like, we might have an in now. We can, we can just make one phone call. It all depends on how the interview goes. So, I mean, <laughs> we, we could also totally blow it. And, you know, like, I don't want to mm. piss off Jesus. If I'm going to piss off somebody, I don't want it to be Jesus, or at least the person claiming to be the resurrected Jesus. Right. So I mean, you're fine with pissing off the devil. Well, no. Look what's happened to Moni since he pissed off the Roswell alien. Yeah. I mean, just look. I don't think I know that story, but I feel <sighs> as though that might take up more time away from... You don't know the story talk. of Moniz and Commander San Isido? Uh, you know what? Yeah. I think I did. I think I did hear that She's one. just saying that now for tacos. No, that's that's the one All right, that okay. I get, no, I get it. All right, okay. No, I'm just kidding. No, you guys got mad on air, right? Uh, no, Wait. <laughs> it, it, no, it was, we it didn't just, get mad. No, 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 yeah. not, not, not you guys. Well, we'll, 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 uh, we'll make it the spooky classic clip of the week this week. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, definitely download the Android app, the iPhone app. I saw Matt is in development, uh, as, as soon as, um, 
Mac can figure out this weird language that is Apple. Right. Uh, but uh, the I Android app is there for you to download for free to check out the show. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us across all social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're on all of it. Um, I think after tonight we have an Ashley Madison account too. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you, you can probably find you'll see me there in a very revealing outfit uh, so you can check out the show across a variety of platforms and formats uh, so make sure that you do that follow along with us and we will be back next Saturday night so until then for Matt for Matt for Stephanie for Chris I'm Tim we want you all to stay spooktacular